This is my question. Um, I'll preface it with this, um, uh, this context. I'm old enough to remember um, when there was a less partisan political environment within the United States. I grew up in a time where Orrin Hatch and Ted Kennedy could be friends and could put aside their political differences um, to pass legislation that was in the best interest of the United States. So my question is around political discourse. Um, I'm going to try to remember it as best as I can, but I got my notes here. They'll help it. Um, over the last couple of decades, our uh, political process has become so polarized um, that um, as we make our points, it's not just enough to um, have a difference of opinion and oppose what the other person wants to promote or wants a, a piece of legislation they want to pass. It seems as if our rhetoric has become that we have to vilify the other individual, that they are the worst person ever and they're out to destroy America and um, if their way gets passed, it's the end of democracy as we know it or whatever, or it's just like the Nazis or whatever it is. Uh, everybody's um, I I invoking that type of rhetoric. Um, and it's, it comes from all sides of the political spectrum, so I'm not throwing stones at one particular group. Um, out of my experience, I know that there are people of faith um, on all sides of the political spectrum, both liberal, conservative, progressive, libertarian, uh, whatever uh, 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 party or non-party that you happen to be affiliated with. Um, and my question is, what role, because people of faith can occupy various uh, uh, aspects within the political spectrum, what role can we as people of faith demonstrate to society that we can have civil discourse without, uh, without uh, demonizing the other side, without belittling them, um, and without uh, resorting to, to fear tactics um, that, uh, that don't move the political process forward. Um, how can we as people of faith um, really help recapture uh, civil discourse, uh, even particularly in areas where we disagree? Longest question ever. Well, I just want to throw in for, uh, just for historical perspective's sake, uh, any of you have read some of the documents that were flying around in the 1790s? Uh, um, it's always been a little bit ugly. Uh, even, you know, so uh, there's actually part of me that wants to blame everything right now on, on what I'd call the collapse of, of the Cold War consensus, which was people on the right wanted to fight the Soviet Union, so they didn't fight too hard on the economic issues at home. People on the left, um, in many cases, actually, you know, uh, went in for things like the Vietnam War. Uh, not the not the far left, but but people liberals in good standing went in for the Vietnam War. I think in part because there was this good feeling of of, of consensus. Um, I think that's breaking down because, uh, frankly, the country's bankrupt, and the fights are going to get pretty dire just because. There's not enough money to go around. The post-war period was very affluential. People came out of the Depression, and we were the only man standing after the war, and it was a great time. There was plenty of money for everything. Uh, I think that's not the case anymore. But again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't blame it just on the economics. Um, we have always come up with excuses to be really mean and, and awful to each other. And I'd like to address why I think we have a trouble with uh, discourse right now. I, I think part of it has to do with the secularization that when God is pushed to the margins, people are hungry for truth. People are hungry for meaning. And we're trying to fill that with a sort of secular post-moral morality, a sort of neo-paganism. We say, you're okay, I'm okay, and we're not going to judge anybody. We're not going to have any opinions. We shouldn't be judging p each other, but we, we should respect that we don't all agree. We should respect that there is real diversity. Instead of trying to put everybody into the same box, um, and, and when, when government becomes a force for morality, you do have to put everybody into the same box. When, when government tries to uh, ban, for example, uh, well, we, we've seen the bakers and the florists who've been uh, conscripted into serving at gay marriages. Well, the government then has to take a stand on gay marriage. But if you got government out of it, if you gave people more personal freedom, then we could have differences. We wouldn't have to argue about them. We wouldn't have to take each other to court. We could love each other and we could talk and the stakes wouldn't be so high. Is it important for our country to nurture a belief in a God who is the foundation of morality and individual rights? I'm looking for yes or no and a reason. I Just to take a quick stab at that, um, 
yeah, I think it is very important for us to, to uh, look for a, a metaphysical foundation of rights and, uh, and, and good behavior and morality. Uh, but as we were talking about, our, my, my Catholic buddy down there, we were talking about the uh, British Civil War, which was, uh, by the way, started by my people, the Presbyterians. Um, and uh, and uh, pretty, pretty ugly period of time. Uh, in fact, the whole wars of religion and the, the Inquisition, and about the only thing worse than, um, than religion and politics is the absolute absence of religion and politics, as we saw in the 20th century with the rise of, of atheistic communism. Uh, they proved that, you know, we thought we had it bad before. Uh, when you completely take God out of the picture, uh, things can actually get worse. Thank you. I'm gonna take a different approach on it and say no. I don't think the, uh, any country, any nation, any government has a role or responsibility in nurturing a belief in God. Um, so that's my uh, understanding of the First Amendment of the Constitution. Our Constitution uh, has a, has a, says that we have unenumerated rights, um, and I think that's one of the things that makes us, well, makes our system more just than other systems. And so even if government doesn't nurture a certain view, the fact that when you go into a courtroom and you're judged by a jury of your peers, that they don't just take into consideration the written law, but also your abstract rights, which are grounded, they're given to you by God, that are grounded in philosophy that isn't told to us, that isn't dictated to us by government. I think that's, that's very important, so. I think that it depends on how we interpret the concept of to nurture. Uh, I would affirm and say, yes, it is the purpose of government to nurture a belief in God. If we understand to nurture to mean uh, fostering uh, an openness among the people so that even those who do not actually come to the belief are still free to live their lives and to teach their children and not to be uh, otherwise harmed. I, I was going to agree with you. I actually don't think the government should be in a position of nurturing. Um, they tend to be actually pretty bad at nurturing in general. Uh, uh, yeah, so I definitely want to clarify that. I think culturally, we as, we as people of faith and, and, and people not of faith uh, should culture, uh, culturally, I think we need to nourish a sense that some things are so wrong that they're beyond the pale that, that this is not, that there is a morality. I think that's where I'd go on that. I'd add the clarification as well. I don't uh, think it's unimportant for uh, instilling moral values and, and having some objective uh, ethics and, value and, and, and objective morality kind of around it. But the way I understood the question is, it, does the country have a role and responsibility in this? And my understanding of separation of church and state says no. Um, there was a comment earlier, and I'll, I'll, I'll add this to kind of clarification. Um, when someone was talking about the justification for passing a law and placing that justification in a biblical or Christian context, my understanding is that that should never be the basis of any law that is passed to say that this law is passed because it coincides with a Christian understanding of religion or it's expressly forbidden in the Bible or any other holy text. Um, I think there's plenty of, of argument and rationale for the objective values, the objective morality, the objective ethics that are rooted in the Magna Carta or the Constitution or other things that are devoid of um, that type of religious um, affiliation or favoring one religion over another. I'm not going to ask a question. As a matter of fact, I'm going to dismiss myself from this panel because if you look down this panel, uh, we're just a lot of white guys. <laughs> and it bothers me that there's white guy voices only on this platform, so I'm going to step down. I, I, I am, you guys are all great people. I also think that uh, we get to a point where we talk so damn much and if we just spend some time doing something, it'd be better than all this chatter. So, that being said, I would, uh, I'm done. I would like to say that the merit of an idea doesn't depend on the color or gender of the person who states it. Uh, recently, and as well as seen on the news, the Middle East has been filled with a lot of violence. I, my question was really, do you think that politics or religion has had a bigger impact than the amount of violence in the Middle East? Uh, because obviously the federal government of the United States has had an impact over there with both turning it and also sometimes actually adding to it. But 
Just beyond this here as well, what do you think has motivated a lot of the violence, not disregarding the United States, politics or religion? Uh, just briefly, I think there's a really strong, I think, desire among a lot of people to deny any religious element whatsoever to what's happening over there. Um, I believe that it's impossible to understand the tensions in the Middle East without understanding the very serious religious element of what's going on over there. There is a very mainstream Judenhaus, a kind of anti-Semitism that's in the Middle East. Uh, it is completely mainstream. 9-11 uh, conspiracy theories are completely mainstream. I would say, I don't know how, what percentage, but it's the norm. And I believe that, of course, you're always going to have both, but I think we ignore the religious element at our peril. I just, I'd go back to the basics. We live in a very fallen world, and, uh, and the church is not immune. Uh, last I checked, the church is full of people, and, uh, and <laughs> people are part of the problem. Well, you were talking about what's going on in the Middle East right now, and those Christian communities and the Jewish communities, which I, I think are pretty much now gone, they've been there for a very long time. And Islam hasn't changed, I don't think. It's still based on what, what Muhammad taught. Um, but there's a lot of people who want to inflame a very radical type of Islam. And so you know, does true Islam teach that you should murder Christians and drive them out of your country? Uh, <laughs> well... They, they didn't for a long time. Were they not true Muslims? I'm not, I'm not a Muslim. I can't really speak to that. Um, I, I, I don't believe they're, they're, well, yeah. I think it's all false to begin with, so. I do think the state right now, the government, is increasingly becoming hostile toward religion as well as the family because government, the state, historically, has recognized that Allegiant when when the citizenry has a lead, holds allegiance to God and the family before the state, the state the state can't get away with as much. The state wants to be God. The state wants to be number one, and so it's very important that we hold our allegiance to God first, to family second, and then to the state. And the state can't stand that, and that's why it's hostile toward religion right now. I would agree with that, but I don't think the I don't think they're hostile to that. But uh, yeah, I I, I, w I would agree wholeheartedly. I think as people of faith. Um, we're primarily citizens of heaven. We are uh, people of the kingdom of God. We are, we are not, uh, our uh, identification as Americans or Canadians or Mexicans is, is secondary or tertiary behind that. Absolutely. Legislation is ultimately enforced at gunpoint. There are a lot of things we would like to change in society, but how much force do we want to use to make those things happen? If a person doesn't go along with your vision of societal change, do you want to send a policeman with a loaded gun to her door? Do you want to take her away from her family, her job and her life and put her in prison? If she resists arrest, do you want the policeman to kill her? It's Just a hard. light, comical question. <laughs> it's awfully hard to say yes to all that, right? <laughs> yes. The Bible has a very clear answer on this. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Punishment is supposed to be commensurate with a crime. Misdemeanors and felonies, they come in grades. Depends on what the woman did, and there's justice meted out depending on what you did. It's a minor crime. Law is instituted by force. You recognize that. That's the way it works. Without it, you don't have rule of law. I think we all agree on rule of law, but if it's a minor offense, the policeman has very limited power. And if it's a major offense, like uh, the, your colleague next to you said, certain things are absolutely reprehensible and can't be tolerated. And other things are very minor, and you can even look the other way. So the Bible has that eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, finger for a finger. I think it goes into great detail that way. Y yes, but uh, that was extrapolated in the Sermon on the Mount to say, you have heard say an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I tell you, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Um, so th th there is some, uh, there is some uh, discussion kind of around that. Yeah. Oh, sure. Um, so the question and, and kind of the point around uh, around tonight, at least as I understand it, is discussing how our faith influences our politics. Um, and I would advocate to, to your question that the, the church <laughs> and our faith should never be involved in enforcement of law and marching people down and at the point of a gun and doing anything like that. Whether government uh, does that, whether the Romans did that, whether the Ottoman Turks did that, whether the United States government does that is another matter of discussion rather than, I think, how we influence in, in terms of faith. 
Somebody asked a question earlier, what is government? And uh, it is a collection of the citizenry, but I tend to think of, of most government officials as walking around with their finger in the air looking for which way the wind is blowing, and that's the way and direction I go. And the role and function of people of faith and government is to help change the direction of the wind. Um, when you look at the civil rights movement in the 1960s or the women's suffrage movement, people of faith help change the wind that caused society to say the treatment of African Americans living in the South, primarily, was untenable. And we have to do something about it. And those people of faith changed the wind that ultimately led to the change in terms of our society. Um, and that's our role and responsibility, not marching it down at the point of a gun, not enforcing it, although that had to be done by the government uh, in Mississippi, in, in Alabama, and other places, to be able to enforce that law, the Civil Rights Voting Act and the, and the Civil Rights Act. Um, however, that is not the role and function of the church in, and, and people of faith in terms of us doing that. I don't, I don't know if that helps the discussion or whatever, so forth, but that's how I see our role and responsibility as people of faith, is helping to change the wind by moving the discourse in a particular direction that brings um, the decisions of our government and governments around the world, not just our government, but governments around the world to operate uh, out of moral principle and out of, uh, out of those values. My general attitude toward the government is, is I wish it would get out of the moral business. Uh, as I had mentioned in my talk, we frequently will, will criticize it when it wants to get involved with things like <laughs> conservative stuff, but you know, the government is constantly pushing progressive values too. Uh, that annoys the daylights out of me. I, I would prefer it if it just kind of like for performs its minimal functions, which is to protect us from the state of nature, enforce contracts, protect our borders, and do national defense, and let us work this other stuff out. Um, and I think that having some sort of a religious life or spiritual life or some sort of a transcendental belief is very helpful to inoculate us against the temptations of a big government. And this is why, even though I'm not personally a member of a church, I think it's good that people are. Because if everyone just stops this re the religious life, we're no longer inoculated against big government and it comes in. Uh, as I've seen in Europe, I speak German and I go to, Germ to Europe quite frequently. The government's very large there and the people have completely incorporated that into their lives. Living here in the cowboy state of Arizona where I don't even have to deal with helmet law on my motorcycle, I live a life of liberty and I'm, f I'm very passionate about that. So I think we all need to get together, no matter what our religious belief is, and I, and I would very much encourage non-religious people and atheists to get on board with this. This is why I kind of like libertarians, because there's a lot of atheist libertarians who are cool with small government, is we need to get this government smaller. And, take, and I think charity is much more effective when it's done uh, at the private level rather than the state level. So we need to get together into communities and look out for each other so that the state can't tell us that it has to do more and more and more. 